Well, we're in Nehemiah chapter 8 this morning. We saw in the last couple of weeks that the wall was completed in a, a stunning 52 days. The gates and uh, doors have been hung, guards and gatekeepers have been posted. The end of chapter 7 tells us that when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns, meaning that they were, the work was completed, they were settled, they were organized, they were structured, of course they were well governed under Nehemiah. So the material needs of the city had been met, safety, uh, security, even dignity had been restored to the city, but the spiritual needs were festering. Remember that the people have been long, dark years in, in exile up to this point. The city of Jerusalem had almost come to the point of extinction, but when that first group of exiles returned under Zerubbabel, they began the process of first rebuilding the temple. There were some attempts to restore biblical worship, but there was no, no genuine enthusiasm about that. They needed revival. You know, any study of revival reveals two major components. One, one is prayer, ongoing, unrelenting, fervent prayer. And the other component is the proclamation of the word that leads to responsive obedience. Any revivals in history that you study, you will find those two things, the fervent prayer and the word being proclaimed and people being responsive and obedient to it. Now, the Jews at this point were, were pretty much out of touch with God and his word. They honestly felt like um, during the exile that they had been uh, abandoned, that God had left them. But the reality as we know it was that God had not moved, God had not changed. They had left him, they had abandoned him, and that's why they found themselves in exile and not at this point even after returning to the city. So they're, they're back in the land, they're regathered as a people. The land is physically being restored. The city of Jerusalem is physically being restored, but there's still this huge spiritual vacuum, and that's where we come to in Nehemiah chapter 8. If you would, look with me, beginning in verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform they had made for that purpose. And beside him stood... Let me pause here. There are two Hebrew professors in this church and plenty of Hebrew scholars. I took a year of Hebrew. I was 21, didn't realize the value. And all I thought about during that entire year of Hebrew was I'm never going to get out of seminary. <laughs> so I didn't take any more Hebrew. Now I'm just asking you Hebrew people, to recognize, I grew, up in, I grew up in a small beach town in South Florida, and I've lived in Arkansas most of my life, okay? We clear, Dr. Deal? All right. Beside him stood <laughs> Matitea, Shama, Ania, Uriah, Hilkia, and Masaya on his right hand. Now, you think that'd be enough, but there's more. <laughs> Padaya. Mishael, Makia, Hashum, Hashpadana, Zaruiah, and Meshulam on his left hand. Oh, we ain't done yet. There's more. Don't worry. <laughs> Verse 5, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Yeshua, Bani, Sherabiah, Yamin, Akub, Shabbati, Hodia, Masaya, Klita, Azariah, Yozabad, Hanan, and Playa, the Levites, helped the people understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. 
And Nehemiah, who was governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. On the second day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people, with the priests and the Levites, came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month, that they should proclaim it and publish it in all of their towns in Jerusalem, go out to the hills, bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square at the water gate and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in booths. For from the days of Yeshua, the son of Nun, to, the day, to that day the people of Israel had not done so. And there was very great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. They kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. Now, many of the people had camped out in Jerusalem during the construction project, especially those that lived outside the the wall, outside the confines of the city. And after the completion of the wall, they had returned to their homes. Now, just a few days later, they're back in the city. Now, clearly this was planned. Uh, Scripture was to be read every seventh year during the festival of the tabernacles. Nehemiah had given them a few days off, uh, all that hard work, but told them to be back on the first day of this seventh month. As a leader, Nehemiah knew uh, the value of what had been done externally and visibly, but he also knew what was inside uh, was important as well. And so he instructs them to come back. You see in verse 1 it says, they gathered as one. What does that mean? They were unified. There was no, no grumbling about having to come back for this assembly. They're gathered where? At the water gate. And it's interesting in, that they gathered at the water gate. In, in Scripture, um, water, when it's used for washing or purifying, is symbolic of the Word. Water, when it's used for drinking or quenching thirst, is symbolic uh, of the Spirit of God. Notice in verse 1 it says this. It says, they told Ezra to bring the book. Who is they? It's the people. The people were hungry. They they took the initiative in, in asking. They had a desire to hear the Scripture because it had been void for so long. And so they asked Ezra, we, we want to know what God's word says. They asked Ezra, Ezra to bring the book. Now remember, they had been working on the wall. It was a hard, difficult work. Most of them had been in, a, in an uncomfortable place, uh, defending the city, working on the wall, uh, sleeping who knows where because their homes were outside the city. They'd been uncomfortable. They'd been inconvenienced. They'd only had a few days off, but now they willingly sacrificed their break because they want to hear from the Lord. They want to hear what his word has to say. Ezra, not Nehemiah, is the one that's, that's leading this time in the word, this, uh, this Bible conference, if you will, because Ezra's the priest. Nehemiah knew when it was time to, to hand off. Verse 2 tells us the gathering, look at this, was men, women, and all who could understand what they heard. Any children old enough to understand were, were there gathered with them. But it was all about those who could understand what was heard. You remember in the parable of the sower, that Jesus told what was important was not necessarily the seed that was scattered. What was important, the emphasis was on the, the understanding that led to action, not just hearing the word. Lots of people hear the word, but that doesn't mean that any change takes place. The parable of the sower was about those who took the word, those, the, word the seed was received, and it was understood, and it was acted on. And that resulted in change, and that resulted in fruit being produced. Well, we know it was the first day of the seventh month, um, that's the, that would be the Jewish equivalent of, of our New Year's Day. And there were three important feasts um, that were observed during this seventh month. God had given his people seven different feasts or festivals that they were to observe to, and, and keep to honor him. And they were not only reminders of what he had done, they also foreshadowed 
future things about Christ's life and death and resurrection and about the second coming. The three that they observed in the, in the seventh month were first uh, the Feast of Trumpets, and that was a day when trumpets were, were blasted. It commemorated the end of the agricultural year. It commemorated the time of harvest that had happened, but it also pointed to the second coming of Christ. We know that Paul said that Christ is going to come with the sound of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. So it looked forward to that time. But after that was the Day of Atonement. It's not mentioned here in, in uh, chapter 8, but the Day of Atonement was, as you know, the one year that the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies, and he went in for the purpose of making sacrifice, uh, making a sin offering for the sins of Israel that would atone for their sins. And, of course, the Day of Atonement looks forward to the coming of the perfect lamb, the sacrificial lamb who died for our sins and was the ultimate and final sacrifice. And then the third feast that we saw referred to here in chapter 8 was the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. During those seven days, the people went out and gathered branches from leafy trees, and they built booths either on the roof of their home or people who were outside the city would build somewhere in, inside the city. One of the places was by that uh, water gate, and they would build these booths, these temporary structures, and live in them, and that reminded them of how they lived prior to coming into the land of Canaan, and it reminded them of how God had provided for them during all those years, and it looked forward to the time when Christ is going to rule and reign on earth and when we all who know him in eternity will dwell or tabernacle with him. You know, the word tabernacle means to dwell or, or means dwelling place. And if you think about it, you can see this concept of tabernacle all through Scripture. God's ultimate purpose was always to dwell with us. It started in the Garden of Eden. What happened in the cool of the day? God came and he walked with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. There was a tabernacle, a temporary uh, structure, a tent structure, temple structure in the wilderness. Why? Because God's presence was with them. You remember he traveled with them. He was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. His presence was always there. The temple in Jerusalem in the Holy of Holies is where the presence of God dwelt. He was with his people. He was among his people. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul said, you, talking to believers, you are the temple of God. The Spirit of God dwells in you, and in eternity we will tabernacle with God. He wants to dwell with us and wants us, his people, to, to dwell with him. Well, these three feasts are going on during this time that we read in, in chapter 8, and all of those feasts focus on God's relationship with his people, so they're the perfect backdrop for his people, for the nation, to, to get right with God and have a fresh start. And that's basically what's happening here. What are they listening to? The book of the law, uh, the Torah, the first five books of Moses, which is the foundation of instruction on how they were to relate to the Lord. It was how he told them they were to relate to him and have a relationship with him. Notice in verse 3 it says that Ezra read from early morning until midday. That's about five to six hours. Now, those other, the Levites that were there with him probably did part of the reading, but for five to six hours, the word was read, and it says there, and the ears of all the people were attentive. They were genuinely attentive. They were hungry. They wanted to hear from the word of God. There, there was no checking of watches. There was no sleepy eyes. There was no yawning during this time. There was no daydreaming. They were hungry for the Word of God. You know, I'm, I'm not so sure that the problem in our day is that the Word of God is so available. You understand that the Word of God was very limited in their day. The, the common person didn't have a copy of the Bible in their home. They didn't have a copy of the scrolls in their home. It was very limited. It wasn't readily accessible, but maybe the, the availability in our day, uh, the ready access has kind of killed the desire. It's kind of a supply and demand issue. The supply is so a plentiful, it doesn't seem to be worth much or in demand for us. Back in 1983, I was working in, at an organization in Fort Worth, Texas, International Evangelism Association, and one of my coworkers, Billy Beecham, had gone to, uh, to, to Switzerland, uh, excuse me, to Amsterdam, where they had the World Conference for Evangelists back in 1983. 
Billy came back and he told the story of a man. There were evangelists from 180 some countries and, and they tried to have interpreters for all these different people from all these different countries. But he came back and told about this one man that about the third day of the conference they had discovered that had a dialect uh, that was so different from any of the translators that were there, they weren't able to communicate effectively with him. And so they went uh, to this man's hotel room to talk to him, some of, some of the leaders of the, uh, the conference, and, and they knocked on the door. And when he opened the door and saw who was there, he immediately went and wrapped his arms around the bedpost of his bed because he thought they were about to send him home. They finally got him calmed down, and they, they found someone who had a dialect close enough they could kind of piece together a conversation, and they explained to him they had just come to figure out what they could do to help him be more effective because they knew there was no one else from his country, no one that spoke his dialect, and this is what he told them. In the last year, my family and I have led a little over 100 people out of our village to Christ, but we only have one page of the Bible. Can you get us a Bible in our language? We're hungry for the truth. And that little bit of truth that they had, they shared in their village. And many, many people came to Christ. Let me just add as a side note here, anytime you have the opportunity to financially support an organization that gets the word out to people who don't have the scripture, you ought to support them. That's a good, eternal uh, investment. All right, Ezra stood, it says in Scripture, on a platform. There were men and women and children. Could have been between 50 and and 60,000 people that stood before him and and these Levites that were there with him. Now, I want you to notice in verse 5, we already saw the people remained attentive for five to six hours. Look at verse 5. It says, when he opened the book, all the people stood. And they remained standing while the Scripture was being read. Not only were they riveted for those hours, they were also standing in reverence for the Word of God. Now listen, I'm not saying this should be the normative for the reading of Scripture. I I know pastors who have their people stand when they read. Uh, I don't think that's the only correct posture. That is a good thing. But I don't think that's the only correct posture. I would say to you the posture of the heart is what's most important. It's great for us to to say we have reverence for God and reverence for his word, but God is looking more about what's happening internally than what we do externally. You know, for me, when I was growing up, I mentioned in the town hall meeting last week, the worst beating I ever got was for running in the sanctuary. There was no one there. It was a Wednesday night. It was dark. They were over in Fellowship Hall, but my mother walked by and saw me run through there. I got beat for that. I mean, the the reverence then for the sanctuary and everything else is so different than today, but one of the things I was really taught was reverence for the Word of God. I was taught how to respect the Word. I was taught how to handle the Bible. To this day, you will likely never see me put my Bible on the floor. If I have to put my Bible down, there's nowhere to put it down. I'll find another book to put under it. I I just won't put it on the floor. Does God really care about that? I I don't know. It's just what I was taught. But I tell you this, God is more concerned about his word falling from my heart than he is me dropping that Bible on the floor. The reverence for the word is not how we handle our printed copy of this book. The reverence for the word that is important to God is what we do with his word when we hear it and whether or not we obey it. Now listen, I'm not just talking about complaining when a sermon goes over 30 minutes. I'm not just talking about whether or not you stand out of reverence for the Word. I'm talking about your your spiritual posture. Talking about what we sang earlier, do we really desire to know more and more of God? And when we hear his word, do we, is our heart already tuned to obedience? I think sometimes when I hear his word, it's just background noise or something I tolerate because I know I'm supposed to. It's not about just hearing what is entertaining or what we want to hear, what makes us feel good. It's about hearing all of the word of God. They were listening to the law and the commands of God, and they were excited about it. <laughs> 
I love the worshipful response in verse 6. Before he even begins reading, Ezra simply blesses the Lord, the great God. And what do they do? They all bow and worship with their faces to the ground. That's a good way to start being prepared to hear from the Word of God. Remembering who he is and whose words are about to be spoken. You see in verses 17 and, or excuse me, 7 and 8, in addition to the 13 Levites on the platform, there were 13 additional Levites that are listed there in verse 7 and 8. Here's here's what they did. First, the scripture was read. That's the starting point. The starting point is always the word of God, not the opinion of a man about the word of God, but the truth of God's word. So the scripture was read, and then these men, who were probably scattered all through the crowd, Help them understand it, and, and they explained it. Remember, again, they didn't have copies of Scripture to study on their own. Also, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. These people who had been in exile in Babylonia had adopted and learned the language of Babylonia, and that was Aramaic. And so these 13 Levites first translated it for them, and then it has this phrase, they gave the sense. What does that mean? They unlocked the door to understanding. They expounded on and gave in-depth meaning to words and passages that Ezra had read. And that's just like preachers are supposed to do today. Many of them don't. But what they're supposed to do is let the Bible do the talking and then they interpret or contextualize. They help, the, they help those that are hearing know, well, how does this apply? How do I apply the written word to my life? Verse 9, the response of the people when they heard the word, they wept. Joy, I'm sure, because they had not heard the word in so long, but also great sorrow because they were hearing how they had violated uh, the commands of God. We don't know how much of the word they heard during exile or even since returning. Ezra had been preaching for 13 years, but people had not really been responsive. But regardless of what the issue was, the supply of the word in their lives was very low. And they're recognizing now that it's it's a precious commodity. And so they're hearing the word almost as if it's for the very first time, and their hearts are laid bare. Not only does the Spirit of God see what's in them, but they're able even to see themselves, their own lacking, and that they're not measuring up. They're probably thinking back to all those years they lived uh, with no spiritual input, and they're remembering the sins of the forefathers that had led them into captivity and put them in the position that they're in today. And they wept. They're deeply sensitive spiritually they're deeply disturbed spiritually they're fully aware of their sin and they have a desire to repent that's a sure mark and sign that revival's coming they're lawbreakers they know that they're worthy of god's judgment there's nothing they can do to avert it they're guilty before god and they recognize that the word is just showing them the depth of their guilt. You know, I'm not sure that that's always my response towards Scripture. Like you, I I take it for granted, and in taking it for granted, sometimes I don't let it pierce to the depths that it needs to and bring the conviction that it needs to bring. And it's easy to get calloused. It's easy to avoid conviction because conviction is is painful. But the pain of conviction is one of those good pains. It's the pain that God uses to help us see the depth of our need and to help us see his grace and to draw us back to him, to to cause us to repent and turn from our sin and come back to him. What's interesting there in verse 9, Nehemiah interrupts their grief, interrupts their weeping, and he says, hey, wait a minute, listen, this is a time to rejoice. You're a people who are repentant, and God is a forgiving God who is bringing restoration. So this is a time to rejoice. You're to rejoice in the Lord. You're to rejoice in his word. That that same word that brings conviction when repentance comes, that same word that brings conviction brings healing. And I thought as I read this and thought about their reverence for the word and their attentiveness to the word and their brokenness over the word, how different 
would our services here be each Sunday if we came hungry to hear the word and rejoicing that we had the opportunity? How different would it be if every car that, that pulled through the different entrances on this parking lot that pulled in and pulled into their parking space before they jumped out of the car and if, if you're a family you run 15 different directions before you jump out of the car if you're a family or if you're here by yourself whatever how different would it be if you stopped and said God thank you that I have the opportunity to come to worship today with the body God thank you that I have the opportunity to, to hear your word would you speak to me today you know I, I think a lot of times we're not experiencing joy in our lives as believers and when we're not we need to look to, to, to the word and our response to it do I believe what God says in his word and do I act on it because when I honor God's word, I honor God, and I'm demonstrating faithfulness to God, and that's where the joy comes from. Am I faithful to God? That, that, brings, that question brings us to the last section here in chapter 8. In verses 13 through 18, you see the, the testimony of their faithfulness, of their obedience. Every day they're gathering for a week. Every day they're gathering at the water gate. On the second day, it says that it was just the heads of houses. It was just the men. And as the law was being read, these men heard the instruction about the Feast of Booths or the, the Feast of Tabernacles. Th this was news to them. This was new information to them. Most of them had been in exile. They had not heard this. And, and they hear that God had instructed for this to take place. And the time for the Feast of Tabernacles was very near. It was just a few days away. It would have been easy to say, well, you know, we, we don't have time to get the word out to all the surrounding villages like it says we're, we're supposed to do. So this is important. But you know what? We'll plan for it. We'll do it next year. No, that wasn't their response. It says they immediately set their hearts to obey. They put the word out, and everyone gathered the branches and made the booths, and they lived in them during the feast, just as God had instructed in his word. And so they celebrated this week-long festival of praise and thanksgiving for, for God's goodness, not just looking back on his provision in the past, but looking in the, in the very recent past and seeing his provision and bringing restoration, not only to the land, but to his people. Verse 17 says, they had not done so since the days of Yeshua when they entered the land. Now, that's not meaning they had not observed the feast at all. There were some who had, but it does mean they had not done it to such, observed it to such a degree. Everyone participated enthusiastically. Literally, there were booths set up all through the city because those who lived outside the city came into the city and, the, and they set up booths. And the attitude and desire of the people was unlike anything that had been seen in the nation before. Their desire to honor God's word and to please God and to be right with God. And for the entire week during this festival, they continued to be taught the word. And you see at the end of the chapter, it says that that time was followed by a solemn assembly. And we'll look at that next week. But what you see in Nehemiah 8 is God bringing fresh life to his people, fresh spiritual life to his people. He's renewing them and he's reviving them. And it's happening because not only is it God's desire, but their hearts, their desires to be responsive to him. God still desires to renew and revive his people today. And can I tell you that the church in America, our church, is in desperate need of revival? Just like in this day, there's a great deal of brokenness in our land. And we can look at the brokenness and we can try to figure out ways to fix the brokenness, but the first thing that needs to happen is for God's people to be revived. Otherwise, the brokenness will never be fixed. Revival comes to God's people. It often, when revival comes to God's people, it results in, in spiritual awakening in the land. It results in evangelism. It results in people coming to Christ. But it starts with God's people. 
And you may be here today and you may think, well, I, I've gotten so cold and I've gotten so spiritually indifferent and, and, and God is so far from me that could never happen in my life. That can I remind you what they had to be reminded of? God didn't move. God didn't move. He's faithful. And just like in the case of the prodigal son, when we make the decision to turn and come back to him, he, he's right where he was. And he's gracious, and he's loving, and he's merciful, and he's ready to receive us. If you're here this morning and you feel like, well, I'm, I'm so far from God, God could never work this way in my life, well, who, who moved? And who needs to make the decision to turn back? God wants to tabernacle. God wants to dwell with us, not just as a body, but individually. When you think about the attention and reverence for the word you see here in chapter 8, remember it's all about the posture of the heart, a desire when we hear the word to bring ourselves in line with the word. And, and if that means repent, then we repent and our obedience is immediate. Can I tell you one of the, the greatest ways to be prepared to give attention and reverence to the word is two things. One is Saturday night preparing our hearts, not staying up late, not watching junk that gets in our heart and in our mind, but then Sunday morning when we show up, having that desire, asking God to speak. You know, if you boil it all down to our attitude toward the Word, it seems like most of us have our agenda. We know what we're going to do. We know what we want to accomplish. We know how life's going to go. We have our agenda. And then if things don't go according to plan, we, we start looking for solutions to get our agenda back on track. But see, the way it's supposed to be is this book is supposed to set the agenda. And this book tells us how to accomplish the agenda. And when we let this book set the agenda, when we follow the direction of this book on how to accomplish the agenda, there is great joy. And that joy may be in the midst of hardship and difficulty in, in following the agenda, but there's, there's great joy. And the joy that these people had was simply because all they knew to do when they heard the word was to obey. They were hungry. It wasn't available to them like it is to us today. And so they were desperately hungry for it, and they heard what he said, and they obeyed. This is the agenda. Yours won't work. Yours won't be fulfilling. Yours won't bring joy. This is the agenda.